right? Many times those kinds of, that kind of work fails, right? And when it fails, you get lots of bad things that occur, right? There can be ill will, and that's actually not even a bad outcome from something like this. Um, many times it will end in litigation, right? You're working under a contract, you're on time, on budget, on feature, you got the triple constraint all done, um, and then ends up in court. But the real tragedy occurs when the customer that you worked with no longer wants to be a customer of yours. Hello. <laughs> um, and when that happens and you lose reputation, right, your competitor just won. The other thing that can happen, of course, is that you spend a lot of time pursuing markets where you compete, but the other guys win. And again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow when we talk about the strategy that goes along with portfolio management. But again, it's not just about projects and not just about the efficient delivery of projects. It's a big misconception. Right? And when you do it successfully, it kind of feels like pinball, with like the real pinballs that go on and on. Right? You do the stuff happy, you get everybody happy, um, you meet, this, you meet um, the objectives of the, of the business, and the business gets to play again. So, where does Agile fit into all this stuff? As everybody knows, Agile as we know it today started in um, Snowbird, Utah in 2001, where they produced the Agile Manifesto. And like most other things, we can compare it by looking at an Agile adoption curve. Now this comes, this idea comes from Jeffrey Moore um, in the book from 2001 called Crossing the Chasm. People are familiar with that book? Yeah? Okay, anyhow, he talks about segments in the market, right? These people in the beginning, that are the real innovators and early adopters, right? They're happy to embrace change. They're very happy to try something out. Now, at the very end of the scale are what they were called laggards. Okay? Why should I change? Everything is great. I don't need anything new in the world. Right? There's a, a group of people called an early majority where you've actually scaled and your new product, in this case a way of thinking, a mindset, okay, um, is out there and to get from you know, the crossing of that chasm between the early adopters and the early majority is a difficult process for most products. Right? There's a late majority um, you know, that are easier to maintain, their you know, advertising effects them well, blah, blah, blah. Sure. Okay. I've been told not to wander past the white line. If I do, just yell. Okay. Now, if we look at Moore's chasm issues uh, against Agile, here's how we kind of work. All right? um, I've been around since the beginning of this stuff, and I'll tell you, it was actually really fun. You know, you you teach a course, you uh, you know work with people directly. Everybody's having a good time. They're kicking butt. Uh, everybody loves it. All right, now, um, yeah, for the last seven, eight years, I've been working primarily, well, started off with early majority people, right, that uh, wanted to know, gee, Agile kind of works, Scrum in particular works in a small organization. We get it. Uh, you know, we can, we can work with that kind of stuff. But uh, we have issues. There's some stuff that isn't all there. Right? Um, we need to be able to talk about the entire product, you know, but things like the tools that support it, you know, standards, all these, all these other issues are kind of like missing. Pragmatists, like myself, can fill in those kind of gaps. Richest people, like late majority people nowadays, and they're actually being addressed. Okay, uh, Dean Leffingwell, and uh, the SAFE process is a great example of how to reach uh, late majority people. 
He has a great chart. It's really, really neat. It puts all that, it's got a lot of boxes. It's got the three lanes going across horizontally. People are familiar with that, right? Well, you, if you're not, you will, right? Because it's getting a lot of traction. Uh, unhappily, it's kind of fictional, right? It, it, it allays fears, makes people feel good about things. Um, and it tries to address all of the issues that we're missing, but it kind of whitewashes it, puts a coat of paint over something which is really not there, right? So in the last 13 years, Agile, in particular the scrub version of Agile, has been a nice, a nice thing to work on there, right? We're told these motivated individuals, Part has changed. Make sure you know integrating early and often. You know uh, have technical excellence. Blah blah blah. It's been fine. The people that have used it, right, are doing pretty well, right. Um, you know, if you were an early adopter of Scrum, you're probably much better off today than you were, let's say, ten years ago. And in particular. You see this happen at the times that people do releases, right? It used to be, and still is for people that aren't doing Agile and Scrum, that releases are this terrible slog. It's a horror story. We have to wait for QA to bless our product. We have to get the ops people to take it and put it onto the right platforms, get the right versions of these components working with those components. You know, and as I like to say, it's, it's cold pizza and not do it till in the morning. And it, you, this still happens, right? I, don't, I, I hope it doesn't happen to anybody inside here, but there's a large majority of, the, of uh, businesses out there that still have this problem, right? Those people, these laggards, fall into a half a dozen different ways of different personas, right? They're usually risk adverse. They look at Agile as a strange way why would you want to do things differently, right? We've been happy along the way. Um, uh, Alan Hall this morning was talking about organizations, right? We have these large enterprise organizations, corporations that are out there. Uh, they don't want to support that change. There might be political reasons inside there, right? Well, what I find is it's usually middle managers that are resistant to that change. Right, definitely at the team level, most teams, if they feel safe, right, will go ahead and make the change and embrace the newness. Usually, when I'm brought in by like a board of directors or a CEO, they want to make a change. They understand that there's a need to change the way that we do things to operate effectively in the marketplace. But it gets into, you know, the implementation of that becomes a problem as you start going down the layers. Okay? Um, Financial accounting, believe it or not, is one of the problems that uh, faces way too many organizations. It has to do with the way that we expense versus capitalize, uh, GAAP principles, FASB, um, doctrinaire, right? I'm, I'm not sure what they call it in this country, right? But uh, you know, the way that we account is, becomes a problem because in, I, I'm, actually, since people won't even start working on, on product work unless they figure out all the financials beforehand. As an aside, um, I have a degree in law. I don't practice very often, but it's kind of a fun thing to have. You know, lets you read through stuff and give advice. If you work with lawyers and you work with accountants, tell them what you want and let them, tell them, figure it out. Don't let them run your business, right? They're there to serve a purpose, use them for that. Anyhow, a lot of organizations, typically the bigger ones, typically the laggards, tried Agile, it's failed, they blame the process, not themselves. Other people don't even want to try, right? You come in and you start to explain the difference in the way that we approach work, and they say, oh, no, 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 that could never work around here, and give you 20 reasons why it won't, yet not want to even try to make a change. So that's been a problem. So what can we do about that? Well, we can kind of raise their comfort level. You know, we can talk to them. Uh, 
many times unhappily what they want is a case study from an organization exactly like themselves that's made the change and has been successful. Um, if there's another organization that's been that successful exactly <coughs> like themselves, they're probably out of business by this time. Right? So you're not going to find a lot of those case studies. You've got to unveil their fears, tell them about uh, you know, what can be better. Um, but most of that stuff really doesn't work. So what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to have to do to address their fears is to talk about the values and principles that others earlier on have really worked through. That's because most of the people that are in upper and middle management have history associated with them. Okay? When they grew up, um, especially in manufacturing, as we're going to talk a little bit about, um, they uh, are able to look at lean and the lean manufacturing stuff. Right? We're going to have to look about you know, how to not do agile and how to be agile. Right? And to do this, we're going to have to get a handle on what's called the Toyota production system. Right? Um, the stuff that we do in Scrum, stuff we even do in Agile, is actually just a dumbed down version of what that stuff is about. So let's move on to that. What has Lean got to do with it? OK, it has a lot to do with Tahishi Ono. Right? He's the guy that kind of invented the Toyota production system. He wrote the book. Right? Um, when he was getting involved in this stuff, uh, W. Edward Deming was actually working in Japan. Um, he became very decorated in Japan, was unknown in the States. Right? Even though he did a lot of stuff for the you know, um, process control during World War II with defense contractors, after that war was over, they said, well, we don't need you anymore. We're going to go back to business as usual. Right? And uh, the truth of the matter is that when you're trying to do something that's different, that's really important, you can't just make one small change and expect that everything is going to get better. Again, I'm speaking from a state's perspective. But uh, when World War II occurred, they did stuff like have tin drives. OK, well, everybody donate their, you know, their spare tin from uh, used hands because we need them for the defense industry. Actually, what, you know, that's nice. It, it can help. But what actually kind of was more uh, instrumental in winning that war was they decided to make a big change. They stopped manufacturing cars. OK, starting in 1943, said no more cars. We're going to use all those plants to manufacture tanks. Now, I'm not saying that an organization has to shut down completely, but you can't expect to do just a small, tiny, insignificant change, like change all of your templates to include the word agile in them, and expect that it's going to make a difference. Back to the story. Um, lean manufacturing can actually also be addressed in terms of where Tahishi Oda was working, which was in the Toyota uh, manufacturing concerns. The guy that started it, his name was Toyota Da, uh, their product pre-World War II was uh, looms, automatic looms. And the first lesson of Tahishi Ono had to do with improving those looms, right? Those looms had non-stop shuttle change motion meaning they were constantly throwing out cloth. Right? And the problem was that when something mal mal malfact no, when something didn't work correctly, <laughs> uh, the loom was spinning out cloth that was defective. Right? So Tahishi Ono wanted to come up and say, well, the first thing we got to do is stop the loom when it runs out of thread. Here's the book, here's the table of contents from the book, which I apologize is in illegible type. Right? But the important notion is that when the book came out, Japan, like the rest of the world, was suffering. This was in the 70s. The book came out in the late 70s. The world was still getting out of uh, problems from the 1973 oil embargo. Right? Um, so some topics inside of here 
you know, stuff coming from the knee, catching up with America, which we're going to talk about. Just in time, it was a big concept, just in time manufacture. Okay, um, the five whys, analysis of waste. These were all exciting topics at the time. Um, but you have to understand it from the Japanese standpoint, right? They were booming in terms of manufacturing. Toyotas were coming to the States, I'm sure, into Britain and Europe in, in large quantities, right? But all of a sudden, after the oil embargo, cars weren't selling well. Right, and, and the growth in Japan collapsed. So the company had to come to terms with how can we still make profits with smaller numbers of things that we were producing. <coughs> so, uh, as we were talking about before, the first problem that, that Tahishi Ono was worried about was catching up with America. Um, what he was looking for was how to get um, what was perceived to be an efficiency gap of 10 to 1 between Japanese workers and American workers. At the time, this wasn't a really big concern because of the, uh, the pay rates that went on. The labor going into the stuff that Twin was putting out earlier was fine because the uh, amount that was being paid out for labor was fine. But now he had to figure out how to get rid of some of that waste in manufacturing. Um, and get that just-in-time uh, manufacturing working throughout the system. Right? And that became the Toyota production system. So the first of the Tahishi Ono sayings I'm going to say is that a period of low economic growth over production is a crime. Right? This was a problem because at the time, Toyota was putting out just a few types of cars. Right? Because they wanted to be extremely efficient about things. Now, they had to figure out how to be effective, reach the markets that they needed to reach, and still be profitable with a larger variety of cars in smaller quantities. Right? That's a real big change in mindset. Right? We're in that kind of a mode. Right? The stuff that we do is very specialized yet we have to do it in a way that's still profitable to run an effective business. So, there are lots of things that are out there nowadays that want to try to address those concerns. Okay, safe is one of them, less is another one, uh, disciplined agile delivery is the other third one. All right, and the people are fine. Okay, the Lovely Wells and the Scott Ambler's of the world they're all, they're all well-intentioned, right? They have great-looking diagrams. But I guarantee you that you're not going to be safe just because of a great-looking diagram. I guarantee you that if you don't go through and look deeply at what this stuff is all about, and you just follow through on the motions of what those processes tell you, then you're not going to be much better off than where you were before. There was a series on television called Numbers a few years ago. Anybody seen that? Yeah. There's a great quote about that, right? If you want to feel better, take a pill. If you want to get it right, you better face the truth. Right? Lean. Right? Lean is going to be the way to get to a true transformation. Okay? Because we have to, once we understand why it was put into place, we're going to get past whatever simplified processes we have that are out there. It also gives me a, a nice way to get and address late adopters. As I said before, they are more comfortable talking in those terms. So let's get down and start talking about them. Right. Photo production system. Um, the, lead, the waste that we're going to talk about have an acronym called Tim Wood. So you can run through that in your mind as we talk about these seven, these seven deadly wastes. Right? I'm going to first talk about it in its intended manufacturing context. I'm going to talk about how it relates to software development. We're going to see what Scrum and Agile have to say about it. And then we're going to close each of those with what Agile misses and where we typically find the problems and even have a little bit of what we might want to do about that. Right? So the T, Tim Wood, Transportation. 
Transportation waste is found every time you start moving your products around, right? Um, every time you move them, you can damage them. Right? You can lose them. You can do all kinds of bad stuff. You'll see it by looking for things like carts, things to move things around with, locations to store them at, fixtures to put them in, right? And uh, big inventory management. Right? That's, how you, that's how you typically see that kind of stuff. In software, we typically see it in things like handoffs. Right? We typically see it when we can't talk to the real person that has the need. Right? And we have a development question. Is that a question in the back? Just, sorry. Yeah, this, this after lunch stuff sucks, you know, because like, it's hot and digesting. Okay. Uh, you also see it in things like we have an error. But I can't let you debug on that system. Uh, so ask me some questions, and maybe I'll give you a couple of snippets of some log files that are out there. So how do we handle this kind of stuff in an agile scrum environment? Right. Well, we typically wanted to bust down those silos and get a team of generalized specialists. We want to collate, co-locate them closely with one another. Right? We want to have collaboration in a high bandwidth environment. Right? We don't want to waste time asking questions and then getting responses. Who in here asks questions in emails? Right? And then gets responses from whoever they asked the question from in an email, maybe immediately, but usually a day or two later, especially where there's distributed teams. Right? We want to work, if we can, in a single stream fashion. Now, the way to understand this is, who in here works on more than one project at a time? Oh, we've hit the jackpot. All right, then we're going to go into the story. Um, yeah, that doesn't work. Okay. Um, there's a, a, a book um, written on the topic uh, called, called Lean uh, by James Womack. Now, at the time, James Womack was a professor um, at MIT. Um, and he was also a consultant on the, on the side. He was talking about processes and lean processes. And he had a uh, newsletter. Remember those? Uh, that he would send out once a month to his clients or prospective clients to talk about you know, workshops that he was going to have or things that he was doing. You know, this is pre-blog days, right? He had two young children, two girls. One was five and one was nine. So uh, wanting to be a father as well as a consultant, one Saturday that it was time to go stuff envelopes with the uh, newsletters, he brought his girls over and said, hey, you guys want to play a game? And they said, sure, Dad. What's the game? He said, we're going to stuff envelopes. So he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the um, number of newsletters in half. You'll have half, and I'll have half. And then we're going to see who can stuff them the fastest. Sounds reasonable so far. All right? The girls said, oh, great, Daddy. We know how to do this. Remember, they're five years old, nine years old. And he said, we're going to take them. We're going to take you know, each of them. We're going to fold them, put them in a pile. And we're going to take that pile, and we're going to go, in, and for each of those, we're going to put them in an envelope. And then we're going to take them and put them in another pile, where we're going to put a stamp on it. Then we're going to put them in another pile, and we'll put the addresses on it. Then we're going to put them in another pile and seal it, and then we'll put them in the pile, and the postman can take it away. And James said to the girls, you sure you want to do it that way? And they said, yeah. He said, who taught you that? Right? These girls knew assembly line work already at the tender ages of five and nine. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a, a flyer, I'm going to fold it, I'm going to put it in an envelope, put the stamp on it, put the address on it, seal it, and then put it away. You was doing one at a time. They were working in large batches. Okay. Um, now, if I ask the question, who won? Naturally, the professor slash consultant won. Right? But why? The why in that has to do with the fact that there was all this waste going on of putting them into piles and making sure the piles don't fall over. 
We're going to talk about the defect waste that occurs later. Right? If they folded the first flyer wrong, they would have a whole stack of flyers and none of them fit inside the envelopes. A huge amount of defect waste. Right. Um, anyhow, you'll see an applicability to this. Single streaming is the goal. It's not always possible. But I guarantee you that when you plan to task switch between n number of projects, that there's a, there's a ton of waste associated with that context switch. Right. You're going to lose focus. Um, you're going to start committing all these wastes. Um, first one is the transportation. That's where it starts showing up. Think as we're going along, you know, batching, right, which is the antithesis of single streaming. There's a, you, can, you can find waste in that with all of the seven. Okay. By the way, uh, of those people that work matrix, uh, how many work in more than two projects at once? How many work in more than five projects at once? Holy moly. Um, yeah, there's, uh, what's his name, um, Weingarten uh, wrote some stuff talking about the number of projects versus just the efficiency inside of those. And by the time you work on five or more projects at once, um, his quote, I'm not going to go into today, was that it's kind of random trying to figure out when anything is going to end. Uh, because of the loss of just efficiency along the way. Forget about effectiveness, right? All right. Well, what does Scrum and Agile miss talking about transportation? Well, well I already kind of hinted about geolocation, right? When you're geo-challenged, you're going to have to find some tools that help you deal with the problem. Now, the common sorts of tools that people reach for are the ones that the software vendors that are out there such as the <coughs> ones, uh, we'll try to provide to you, right? Uh, that might help. Many times it hurts more than it helps. The simple things, right? Instead of, if uh, Alan was talking about this this morning, you got a scrum board. Unhappily, I can't see the scrum board in New York and Bangalore at the same time, right? So, you know, people say, oh, we we'll use you know, agile software management tools. Yeah. How about something simple like a video camera on the scrum board? <laughs> right? And it's up in both places at once all the time. Right? There's another concern in transportation. I think I went into this one last year. Um, but I have this thing about this fetish, about product versus platform concerns. Right? Platforms are the things that we put together that allow us to build our products from it. So especially in a large enterprise, there might be some components that are put together which are used within the organization. Think of Microsoft and things like Olay and you know, the comm work that was done back in the 90s. Right? Um, they made these things so they could build lots of products off of them. That also means right, that they now have two streams of work which don't necessarily go together. Right? So when you do that, there's naturally an inclination to build out the platform stuff kind of like first in large batches and then have the product people use the fruits of that labor to produce the products with. That will elongate your cycle time, right? which is not a good thing. Oh, <laughs> I had to add this one because I had a client where the CIO was so proud when he announced the organization a separation of church and state between development and QA. Now, having a QA department by itself is kind of a smell. Right? We'd like to take those QA people and embed them with the teams that they do QA with and actually make them into developers of the, you know, automate their work so that we can work continuously, make sure that we have progress. That's the goal of QA nowadays. Uh, but gee, it also puts together attention. If you have a group that has the authority to say, yeah, you've done all this work, but we don't give it our seal of approval. Go back and do more. Right? We now have politics that will start creeping into the equation. Uh, you'll have a reluctance to give them something 
which you know isn't going to pass. You're going to put some impedance on the whole process, and that's just a bad thing. All right. Um, so there are ways around these. Scrum and Agile don't address them. All right. So we've got to figure out through continuous improvement how to make those things work. All right. There's lots of solutions we can talk about, but be aware of them. Okay. So now there's an I. I stands for inventory. All right. Inventory talks about the waste that occurs when the amount of work in process is building up. Right? So here's, here's WIP, right? Here's inventory uh, sitting in um, a port with lots of cars. People spent a lot of money putting all these cars together. They're worth something, right? They're sitting there and rusting, right? So their value is going down all the time. Right? You don't want a lot of work in process. Again, back to the batching. Right? In manufacturing, you see this with loading docks. The need to go to a last in, first out instead of a first in, first out kind of mentality. Um, the amount of extra process that you have to put in place right, for defects and change, right? because we can't affect our inventory that's out there. Now we've got to figure out how to separate them. Maybe we've come out with a new model and we have to discount all of these. Right? In software, of course, we see this when we have analysis requirements, design, and specification in terms of gates and stages, in terms of documents that are heavyweight and maybe they're not looked at. Right? We talk about this, again, back to platform concerns. When architects start planning out what they're going to be doing for the next year, meanwhile we have developers that are sitting around saying, well, what should we be working on right now? All right, what are the patterns to work on now? Scrum and Agile, right? We try to get rid of inventory waste by not creating the items to begin with. Right? So this is actually a picture of um, work that I took with a, a team that I've been working with. Um, when you look at it, this is, this is now, and this is the future. And instead of taking and splitting up all the stuff that is way out of the future into small areas, we leave it alone. The future will handle itself. We may find we don't need that thing anymore. Or we may find that we need to move this thing over to here. Right? And there's no need to split up stuff beyond what we need right now. We want to keep a memento of it that's out there, but we want to break it down just in time. Right? And in, in Agile and Scrum, this means breaking down the stories uh, when we do things like iteration planning, or maybe a little bit you know, less when we do like release planning and whatnot. Right? We want to match the level of effort that we have to do um, to cover the, the risks of not doing it. The uh, quote, if you're going to do one, okay, you can put this, like, tattoo it backwards on your head or something so you can see it when you look at yourself in the mirror, right, is delay decisions until the last responsible moment when we have the most information and make the best decisions, right? So we tell product owners, look, you understand the business more than we do. Right? We want to work with you. We want to understand why you're asking us what this is that you want. Right? But we tell them to single stack rack, single stack rank backlogs. Right? And we tell them don't put too much in there. Right? If there's too much stuff, there's a hundred items instead of ten items in a backlog. Right? The effort of keeping it in a single stack rank doesn't increase by ten increases by 10 squared. All right? If you have 1,000 items in there, it's not 100 times, it's 10,000 times harder. Right? What do we miss? Well, back to that nasty stuff with platforms and products. We got a component mentality. Right? We create dependencies. Now, not only do we create dependencies, but we typically split off the work from our platforms and products into different teams, right? So now those, those become process dependencies, and they typically are handled 
you know, with one being first and the other being second. Optimally, they're like finish to finish constraints. Right? The other thing that we do in terms of inventory is we decide, oh, we should be writing stories. Let's write a bunch of stories. I once was uh, coming to a client to do a transformation, and they heard of Agile, they heard of Scrum. And when I got in there, they showed me, I, you know, I said, all right, here's how we're going to write stories. And they said, yeah, we've been writing stories. And they showed me this wall of hundreds of stories on it. I said, we're going to do it that. <laughs> right? um, you, you can write too many stories. Right? You want to make them really precise for the stuff that you're about to do and very cursory for the stuff that's out in the future. Right, that will allow you to make, maintain it. And uh, we're going to talk a little about that kind of stuff tomorrow from a strategic content, not today. OK, the movement waste. Now, movement contrasts with the transportation waste. Transportation, we're talking about damaging the products themselves okay, by moving them around. Um, in this waste, what we're talking about is the waste on the entity that's moving them, right? So there's wear and tear on the equipment, uh, injuries to workers, right? Um, accidents that could occur. Tahishi Ono, when he was talking about this, was talking about workers who have to spend time sharpening their drill bits so they could they could create precise holes. So they would take them and walk them over to the drilling to the grinding machine then walk back, right? The, the bits themselves uh, were wearing, right? And there were lots of solutions that were, you know, posited, like, well, bring the, you know, the, um, the grinding machines closer, maybe make one for each worker, that way they'll lose less time. Or if you look and ask things like five whys and understand the root cause of the problem, not trying to just fix the, the defect, but fix the problem, Real problem is they weren't using lubricants when they're drilling the holes, right? So the drill bits were wearing out too quickly, right? Um, in software, there's that task switching stuff that we already kind of alluded to, and if I had more time, I'd love to go into the neuroscience behind this, right? Because the brain can't process really two things at, at once, okay? Like the cortex it doesn't work that way. Right, so we can't really multitask. Right? I know if I ask people, can you multitask? I say, oh, we're great at that. You know, I could be in a meeting and answering emails. And it's like, no, you're answering emails. You were sitting in the meeting, but you weren't part of it. Right. Um, we also see this when we try to force teams to use enterprise solutions. So like, OK, we're going to do continuous integration with this company. Everybody uses Jenkins. Why? Because I say so. <clears throat> that isn't the right way to do this. This is going to cause you know, a, a, a waste in terms of the people using it. It's going to affect them. Right? In an agile and a scrum fashion, um, I have to say we bring the projects to the teams. Okay? Rather than forming teams around projects, teams get to know one another. They don't have to waste you know, learning how to interface with one another. Right? We don't matrix them with a project plan and then mesh the two together. You know, look at uh, load factor, oh, I'm sorry, um, load utilization for each team member and say, gee, we solved it now. Everybody's efficient. We also, and I know what Alan's going to say about this, uh, like when we do our iteration plans and we say, this is what the next two weeks is going to look like, we want to try to single stream that as much as possible. We don't want to go every day and reevaluate it and say, oh, well, you know what, let's stop doing this one, let's do this one instead. Oh, you know what, let's stop doing that and do this one instead. What we want to do is say we've made a plan. The worst that we had is two weeks where we worked on something and it wasn't the right thing to work on. Yeah, we kind of know that. It wasn't the right thing to work on. Um, so you're allowed to change, it's legal. But it should be rare that you make changes in your two-week scrum iteration plans. Unhappily, we have problems with this in terms of debt. Right? 
Um, we know we have problems with our code. When's the time to take out to go fix those problems? All right, when do we start making better products with no defects at all? Portfolio analysis is another big issue that we want to work out because we do, at a strategic level, want to plan our supply versus our demand for our time. Talk about that one tomorrow. Movement. W, on waiting. So, waiting occurs when we have goods that are um, being processed, you know, or not being transported, but are just sitting around, right? And um, a large part of the life that a product goes into is actually in wait time, right? So, um, again, back to that Lean Thinking book from Womack, right? Talks about Coke, Coke in a can. Right? They took the entire process of what it takes to assemble coke and put it in an aluminum can. <coughs> right? It actually takes 320 days in reality. But when you look at what time was spent in waiting, right, at 320 days, the vast majority of it is wait time. It only takes three hours to make a can of coke. Right? There's digging it, there's you know, the oxidation to take out the bauxite. They're smelting it, you know, another two hours there. Um, you know, then you have to fill the can with the soda water and whatever else they put into it. If the people at Coca-Cola could figure out how to get rid of all the waiting, they would in a heartbeat. Their profits would shoot up because the cost would go down so much. They can't, we can change our process. We don't have to like smelt um, ores, right? Well, in software, the biggest wait time is on decision making. All right, I can't tell you how many times people have product issues. They say, we want to do this with our software. That's great. Now, specifically, what about this case? Gee, I don't know. We're going to have to go back and bring that into committee and talk about it. We'll get back to you in a month or two. Huh? What's your best guess? All right, product owners, should be, they need to be empowered to be able to make those decisions even if sometimes they make wrong decisions, right? Um, we have wait time when we are waiting on dependencies. We shouldn't figure out great processes for, for managing dependencies. I'm sure. How many people in here have a lot of meetings where they manage dependencies between teams? Yeah, I mean, really? That's great, I mean, that's, that's actually not bad, but I'm sorry for you. <laughs> But uh, a lot of customers I talk to have these ornate processes for managing dependencies. Don't manage dependencies, break dependencies. Take all the things that are, are dependent upon you, make them part of your delivery organization, and work only on small slivers at once. Right? That gets rid of the silos, that gets rid of the specialized activities. Right? We don't want to wait on them. Because we end up waiting anyhow, even though we plan around them. In Scrum, we make the product owner a full-time member of the team. In a highly collaborative, co-located situation, if you've got a question, you ask the PO. The PO will give you an answer. All right? We uh, get rid of all the administrivia by putting Scrum Masters around. They get to do all the dirty work. All right? we wanna, you know, the big secret is we want to keep the people on the delivery team focused and single stream on getting stuff done. Right. We want to take, as I was saying, those specialized talents, the people in silos, and bring them part, to be part of our teams. And we ask light planning to synchronize daily, okay, so that we are sure that as a team, we're all working together rather than kind of going in separate Brownian motions and hopefully getting things done. Um, and even though I'm not much when it comes to sports, and especially um, uh, rugby, where the word scrum comes from, which I know you guys know a lot more about it than I do. Um, teams usually work together collaboratively, you know, to run the ball down the field. They don't just do every person for themselves and look at me, I can run faster than you, right? So we want to make sure that we're always working together and there's that last responsible moment, dictum to go in with that, right? We always want to make forward progress. Unhappily, there are times when we can't do co-location. 
especially in today's world where we spatially geolocate teams in different areas of the globe. Right? The one that, that we can do something about was the thing I was talking about before. Um, accounting, <laughs> why was this in there? Because I've seen it occur, right? Um, having developers account for their time, especially when they have like multiple stacks of things to do, that's ridiculous, right? Um, and many times it's something that I can't even give scrum masters to do because it's knowledge that only developers know. But there's a huge difference between being so precise in the amount of time that's spent on doing this task or that task, right? and that's what accounting calls for is precision, that we're forgetting that that's not very accurate. Right? Um, airline schedules are extremely precise. Airline schedules are not very accurate. Right? We measure time because we can. Right? It's not the most important thing to measure. Progress is better to measure. That's hard to do. Right? Um, and the other problem, and I've seen this one occur, is when you have platform teams that start into something which is so swirly that they and only they, and only they working as a team, um, can use the, the products of their labor, um, they have a huge problem. So you have lots of uh, members on delivery teams that are waiting for platform teams to do something for them. Right? And uh, again, we can talk about that, talk about last year, platform versus product concerns. Overprocessing. Overprocessing occurs anytime we do more work on something than a customer requires us to do. Right? Um, that typically occurs in manufacturing when we have components that we use for assembly that are more precise, higher quality, whatever than what we really need, right? And um, you, know, you can see this you know, with lots of heavyweight processes that are out there. Here we're talking about manufacturing, right? Where we're trying to finalize our design. Right? We want to get all the requirements right before we commit to a blueprint to start building something out. You know? Now in software, we see this in gated processes, right? Sign-offs, cycles of that. Okay, it's a dead giveaway. Another dead giveaway occurs when we have gold plating. Instead of using code that's plenty good enough that will be refactored in the future. Um, I've actually seen teams, um, and this occurred within the last six months, a team that was trying to migrate from a MySQL database, just using JDBC, right, to communicate with it, to an Oracle database. And rather than say, well, let's just change the few you know, things that are going to be a little bit different, like connections, they actually went through and added a whole new abstraction layer, just because. It's like, are you ever going to go back and use that other one? Why are you so you know, worried? But you know, again, if, if, if you start seeing problems from a, you know, wow, we can make this even better with another abstraction, that's going to be your fallback position. You're always going to do that. Right? Um, you also see this in the traditional world where people come up with the mantra of, I'm in the code, so uh, I think in the future we're going to need this feature, I'm going to code it now. Unhappily, most developers don't have a good vision of the future. I don't know if anybody really does, right? <laughs> Ask the stock market. Um, and 90% of the things that we as developers think are sure to be used in the future are either just plain old wrong or they're done a different way. And now we have you know, more code to maintain. And the amount of labor that it takes to maintain n lines of code is one quarter the amount of labor it takes to maintain two n code lines. Right? So the you know, code that we don't have to put in, unnecessary code, is code that we don't have to maintain. In Scrum, we like to think about time boxing, right? Now, time boxing, <laughs> Alan said some derogatory things about this this morning, right? Um, time boxing isn't an alien concept for most people. I don't know of anybody that went to college that didn't time box and cram at the end, 
all right, because you're forced to do it. We, we understand about it. Um, I like to think about it more in terms of, you know, coming from an electrical engineering background, right? They're, they're good sync points, okay? And the more frequently we can sync up and make sure that we have a full build, okay, and integrate our code back to trunk all the time, the better the quality is going to be because we're integrating early and often, right? So, yeah, there's something weird about burn-down charts. I get it, right? But um, it's not, not the end of the world. Uh, again, this is how we do it in Scrum, right? The other thing about this is that we bring product owners in, right? And we like to separate, and we should, um, the, the stuff, the asks, the what's, and particular the why's. Why are we asking for this thing, right? And we're saying, business product owners, it's fine. That's your domain. You ask that stuff. You may have some ideas about how we're going to go about it, but don't tell us how to do it. On the delivery teams, we'll talk about how to do the work and who does the work. And if we keep that kind of uh, mentality of uh, we understand some of the stuff about the what's and the why's, but we're responsible for doing the who's and the how's. Product owners are responsible for the who's and the how's. They might have some, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the what's and the why's. They might have some idea about the how's and the who's but they don't get to control that, right? So that, that kind of makes sense, right? What we, what we miss, okay, is cultures inside of organizations that pit themselves against one another, right? This happens because a lot of times organizations sequester the engineers, sequester the people doing development from the business side of, of the domain. I'm astounded the number of times I'll visit people that are producing software that have never even run the software. They just know they're one little section of it. They're like little cogs in a large machine. Right? And forget about the fact that they don't even know where this applies. Right? Um, there's uh, stuff where if we don't go through the stack <coughs> continuously, right, so that we don't get efficient designs, then we never get to capture the, the, the work, uh, we never get to capture the value of the work that we put into it, right? So we go through all kinds of extra layers of complexities and abstractions, and it's unnecessary, right? And there is a problem, okay, and the problem for people around here especially, talking about architectural concerns. Again, it's not the production of code that really determines whether or not we've been successful. It's that our business is successful. However, uh, in the future, if we don't take a look and worry about you know, the, the overall structure of the code, i.e., those things that are hard to change over time, i.e., the, the architectural decisions, then we're going to have problems with it. So, story to go along with this. Uh, anybody here from Sweden? Okay, good, I'm not going to offend anybody. Um, back in the 17th century, Sweden was a, a fairly large concern when it came to naval operations. And they were going to get a new flagship for their navy. And they were going to call it the Vasa. And because it was going to be a flagship, no cost was going to be um, eliminated. This is a model of what the VASA was going to look like. However, uh, the VASA was uh, beleaguered with a lot of what we would call nowadays feature creep. Right? They came out with these new cannons and said, oh, the VASA's going to have those. They, they said, oh, the British have like two layers of, of guns. Oh, we'll put those on the VASA too. And they, they did all this stuff. There was a lot of what we would now look at as feature creep. <laughs> haggling, wrangling, backyard politics. Um, by the time they were done with the design of the VASA, to get it out on time, they had to hastily construct it. Well, they did that. And they launched the ship three years later in 1628. However, because they didn't look at the architectural concerns, they took the VASA, put it out in water, you know, within 1,300 meters, which is not even close to a mile, right? There's a small wind, the ship just 
keeled over and sank. Okay, um, and we don't like that in software. The analogy has to do with architectural concerns and you know trying to please everybody all at once without doing iterative design and validation. Overproduction. Okay, overproduction um, is occurs when you have more product available than what is required. In other words, you're not doing just in time manufacture. It's a little bit different than inventory, right? Although if you overproduce, you're gonna get inventory, right? Um, but you can also do this internally, where you're not consuming everything that you do, and you're not getting a laminar flow, which is a flow without drag through your process, right? Um, and the common sign that overproduction is occurring is when you start having lots of processes to manage demand, right? And try to smooth over large batch effects, right? Um, now in software, there's a famous set of studies from the Spanish uh, Chaos Group. Uh, they made a report, and they said that two thirds of all of the features that produce everybody knows this one are rarely or never used. All right now, it's actually a, it, it, when you say that to teams, it's 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 nice and like you know Scrum 101 to say that and like uh, make sure that you're producing the right stuff. Don't ask for things that are never going to be used. For those of us that produce commercial software. This isn't that easy. So think again of like a Microsoft, a Microsoft Office, right? Well, I don't know if they have any competition nowadays, but it used to be that you would compare Office against other products that were out there. And you look through feature by feature, and like Office has this feature, but you know the other one doesn't. Office has this feature, but they don't. So you want to produce uh, products, software products, that have a maximum amount of features. And happily, customers don't want really feature-rich products. They want products that are easy to use. So Microsoft invested zillions of dollars with these overly complex Office products hiding all the features, right? With ribbon bars and lots of UI tweaks that are in there, specifically to hide that stuff. Okay. Requirements, testing, staging, if there's starting to be choke points, another problem. When our dependency and and release planning becomes so complex uh, because we, we would like to produce stuff, but we're saying, oh, we can't do it now. We'd be overproducing. It's not going to show up in our release, right? It doesn't, you know, we have a problem matching supply and demand, right? Um, does anybody in here know where these frames come from? I didn't think so. Yeah, I'm showing my age here. Uh, you've heard of an of a early uh, situation comedy called I Love Lucy. Probably everybody. This is from a very famous one where Ethel and Lucy uh, decide to get jobs, which for women of the 50s was unusual by itself. And they get a job in a candy factory. Their job is to take each candy and wrap it. Right? It starts off very nice and easy. Just a little thing rolls down the line. Oh, we can wrap this. And, and talk and have a nice time. And then the line starts speeding up significantly. And uh, that's where the humor comes from. You know, uh, Lucy is like eating them by the handful. She's stuffing them down her blouse and in her hat. Okay, and, and then they finally, the supervisor comes out at the end, right, because they've been pretty good in like hiding the fact that there's overproduction going on. And of course, seeing that the line is nice and clear, she yells, okay, speed it up. So uh, yeah, if you uh, and you see this all the time in the office, right? If you go through heroics, getting a release out, that starts to become the baseline for all the future releases, right? So the idea of having sustainable engineering, right? That kind of an agile concept, you know, this is why. All right, in Scrum and Agile, product owners become pigs with the delivery team, right? They get to say when we put stuff in, when we get the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, right? We have our teams composed of everyone that we need to create the software with, right? We have a scrum board, common board is really what it is, right? Where people come in, they don't get the work assigned to them, rather they pull work from the board, 
They work together in that, that little session that we call the, the daily stand-up or the scrum. Right? They do their daily planning. They figure out the best way to allocate themselves to get the work done. Right? And um, to do this, we are making sure that we don't overproduce and figure out how to put together our own little silos. Kind of like Womax kids. Right? We want to make sure that we single stream and get you know, the stuff done rather than have to balance out supply and demand. Right? But, but it doesn't work um, efficiently when um, delivery teams are only infrequently engaged. Right? So in a, in a typical sort of an IT setting where um, maybe a department doesn't get to ask questions, uh, make requests of, of delivery teams too uh, often, then I'll put together a huge batch of requirements and I'll ask for everything in the kitchen sink. Because, you know, this is the only time I can make that request, I'm going to request you do all this stuff for me, which of course isn't going to happen. Right? If you have a culture in your organization where everything is overplanned, right, not tested, okay, especially in organizations that uh, find that they don't have time to do the proper cadence associated with iterative development and iterative testing, right? And just say, okay, we're going to do all the coding, everything will go great, it'll all, you know, put together, we can put together a release, everything will go great. We'll test it, you know, like QA run through it a couple times, everything will go all great. Well, it doesn't, all right? Those are the times when you have cold pizza and Mountain Dew at 2 in the morning, all right? Um, and th this also occurs, right, when organizations basically keep the delivery, the development staff at starvation levels. Right? There's just not a lot of people around to do the work. And when that happens, we're looking for little efficiencies that we can give to each of these teams, or each of these silos usually is what they end up forming. All right? um, and we do lots of upfront planning which we then push down to the teams. Here's how to do this work, guys. <coughs> this will lead to lots of bad problems. And we'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow more in depth. Right, but everybody gets this concept, right? If we have overproduction, how to deal with it, right? It's gonna, it, the only manual way to go about it is to plan. And planning is gonna get you there because you don't know all the, all the issues. Finally, uh, in terms of uh, ways we'll talk about defects. Defects. Defects are defined as any time um, we need to do rework on a part, right, um, <coughs> incurring extra costs along the way. Right? So again, our whip increases. Instead of getting a nice smooth flow of raw materials into finished product, we get raw materials, oh, we got to go back and fix that one. Oops, this one went down in the worst case, right, where you have an assembly line, and you don't figure out that you have a defect early on. Right, the problem is that, let's say there's 100 stages in the line, and let's say that you don't figure out the defect until you're way down the line. All the rest of the line now has all those defects inside of them that went unnoticed. Again, going back to the Womack envelope folding thing, right? You don't notice the defect, perhaps, and that the uh, folded newsletter didn't sit, fit inside the envelope, maybe until you tried to fold it and lick it to make it seal. Now you got to go back and fix everything, right? So even large defects that occur aren't usually a problem if you can find them right away and fix it. But if you find them way downstream, they become a problem. Even small defects become a problem. And I was going to ask for a marker and we didn't get one. Well, that's the third strike of mine today. But let me give you a little story um, that occurred to me and <coughs> fixed this in my mind. It has to do with the cost of defect remediation. And it had to do with um, my first time as an architect um, for a big product. And it was a, a product that did finite element analysis back in the when was that? early 90s, very early 90s. Okay, uh, written for um, Motif, X Windows Motif, 
Fundamental analysis is a really hard problem. All right, it's uh, not an easy thing to put together. And uh, we had lots of planning around how we're going to go do it and the approach that we had. I had about 100 people, you know, that worked in the organization with me. And uh, we were late. We had a conference coming up where we're going to announce our product. But because everybody knew that the product was going to be announced at the conference, our sales went to <coughs> zero. This was not a good thing for our company. So one day I was in the men's room. Since this applies to everybody but two individuals, you all know the uncomfortableness when you're standing at a urinal, right? You know, there's, there's rules, right? Guys here, blank here, then a guy, then blank, then a guy, right? That's the way it works, right? I am there, and who walks in but Lou Delmonico, the CEO of the company, right next to me. Well, that's, you know, that's a fall right there. You don't do that. And then he makes the second mistake. He starts talking to me. Right. And Lou says, how's it going, Howard? Great, Lou. Nice to see you. He says, well, how's, how's the development of this stuff? When are you going to be done? Real soon now, Lou, honest. And I quickly, you know, move away, walk my hands back into the hall. Lou's on my tail. All right, Lou comes out into the hall and says, listen, I got something important to talk to you about. OK, what's up, Lou? CEO of the company, you know. And he talks, you listen. And he says, uh, hey, can somebody throw me a marker? And of course, somebody runs inside and gets him a marker. Lou goes up to the wall. And you're going to have to see me use this marker just to use it in your mind. And draws a diagram where he puts a line like this, like axes on a you know, for a plot. And he draws a curve, right, kind of exponential, kind of, you know, quadratic. Right? And I say, uh, Lou, Lou, you're putting marker on the walls. And he says, nah, don't worry about it. You know how much we're saving in development for Patreon? Um, a gallon of paint at Home Depot will cost 10 bucks. I'll fix it. So this is important. So what he said was, now look over here. He this at the top, on the upper left of the chart, with time going in this direction and dollars going vertically. So up here, he said, this is the point that occurs on the cost of defect remediation for something like cars. If we were to design a car that had disc brakes that were too small, and these cars were failing in the field, this is what it cost the company. It could kill the company. Right? They don't want that. So now on the other hand, we move the pen down, or a lot less cost and a little further closer to you know, now. So if we find the defect in final assembly, well, you know, we can stop and go fix everything. It'll still be expensive. A little bit embarrassing, maybe it's going to delay the introduction of the model, but people aren't going to die. So now, and then he starts going way lower on the curve, closer to, the, to now. Says so if we can find the defect, and it's just in the time when they hand manufacture a prototype, and they bring it through the parking lot to see if the wheels fall off, we find the defect back there that we had disc brakes that were too small, nobody dies, we don't even have to manufacture a bunch of cars, it's fine. So now our product, and he showed me right at the very beginning of the curve, okay? So now our product, when the engineer draws the circle and says, I want a disc brake, we want the software to come back and say, nine inches isn't big enough, you need 12. Then the cost of fixing it is like zero. Right? This applies, of course, to the work that we do, right? If we have defects that are caught by our customers, it can kill us. We have defects that are caught by QA, you know, before a release, that can be bad. We have defects that we can find when we're doing, you know, project level, product level, I should say, integration. Again, not so great, okay? We can find the defects when we're still working inside the IDE, maybe in our unit test, that's where we want to be. Right? So the cost of defects can be a real problem. Right? So when do we see this in software? Well, here's one way we see it. Right? Uh, defects happen. Right? Software is it's a tough business. It's like the most complicated, complex thing that human beings have ever endeavored on. Right? Especially nowadays where you start measuring code bases, you know, not just in tens of thousands, or not just in millions of, of, of lines of code, but bigger. Right? I was saying uh, before, a major defect 
found close to the time that the defect occurred is usually not a big deal. We can fix it. Right? But when we get minor defects, such as that 9-inch disc brake that should have been 12 inches that starts failing and killing people on the road, that can be a killer. Right? It can cost us a lot. So, how do we deal with this stuff? Well, the scrum process itself, okay, even without engineering practices, and I'll talk about that in a second, those engineering practices, right, are going to be things like continuous integration, test-driven development, all that goodness, right? Even just the standard processes in Agile slash <coughs> Scrum goes a long way. Because the idea is that you develop a little, test a lot, right? Integrate early, integrate often, right? And we keep our, our whip, our working process low. Then, when we start mixing in the rest of the kind of stuff that we want to do, right, CI, automated unit testing, acceptance testing, regression along with that, automated deployments, right, to get towards continuous delivery, right, um, and the whole idea of craftsmanship, right, we get closer to the point where we can always say we're always ready to ship. That's where we want to be. Okay, unfortunately, we get pushed back. Okay, organizations that are starved, right? they don't have enough people that are out there, they're going to come back and say, well, look, we don't have time to get better. We've got, we got commitments we have to meet. Right? Test-driven development can be described because it's a lot like dieting. Right? You know that it's good for you, but it's really hard to keep up with it. Right? If we um, push work to teams so that we can meet deadlines rather than pull work, that iron triangle that we're used to, right? The iron triangle of uh, resources, features, and time. It's actually not a triangle, it's a tetrahedron, right? There's another vertex on it that says quality. So if you push a team and say, you've got to get this stuff done on, on time, on budget, on feature, sometimes they can do it with heroics, but the quality will flatten out. So you don't want that to happen. And, favorite of mine, is that um, too many organizations hire based on like a resume or certification or experience and you know whatever. What they really hire for is the most number of features with the least amount of money, right? And they don't even know their names. They don't even care. They're fungible. They're just Java developers. Why and why the case full, right? I'd much rather have five really good A-team players than 50 fungible developers. All right? Five guys or, or women <coughs> that um, can really get together, that know what they're doing, and are good. The amount of communication, all right? five versus 50, it's not 10 times the communication, it's 100 times the communication. Again, it's an N-squared problem. All right. All right. Whew. Let's talk about some final little thoughts. Right. Scrum and Agile aren't bad, but just going through the motions, thinking that you're getting something done, well, you're not getting it all done just by going through the motions. You're actually just getting started. So following up on Alan's thing, okay, you didn't see these particular photos, right? of cargo bolting. Let me give you a little background for cargo bolting. Who in here knows who Richard Feynman is? <sighs> Those of you that know, um, a, a physicist from Caltech, uh, very, made famous in the public eye because he was the guy when the space shuttle exploded, had the O-ring theory. He was on the committee, right? So, um, and he also had a number of lectures that, if, if you have time, go back and look at his introductory lectures on on physics, they're wonderful to look at. Hey, Richard Feynman gave the commencement address at Caltech in 1974. <coughs> and back in 1974, there was a lot of parapsychology and spoon bending and all kinds of you know paraphysics stuff going around. And people were doing experiments and saying, look at all these wonderful parapsychology things. And Feynman just railed into them in his commencement address and called it a lot of pseudoscience. That's where the words about the coconuts on the ears, you know, where he said, um, 
we're running experiments that have all of the elements and illusion of real science, but it's really pseudoscience. Right? And you know, so cargo cults, and he was, again, he was, I think, the first person to bring this out, okay, about the um, islands in the, in the South Pacific. You know, they, you know, they saw all this 20th century technology come to them. They wondered why when the big birds left, all of the cargo left with them, right? So they started to do things that tried to attract those big birds, the planes, to come back and land. And they did, right? So merely doing the practices and the precepts of Agile, some kind of a process, isn't going to transform your organization. Right? You're not going to get the game with some, without some pain to go along with it. Right? Fixating on the wrong things is going to land you in a bad place. Okay. Uh, for example, this is like, uh, this never happened before GPSs. Right? Every year, there's like five or six cars that go into the middle of lakes because they fixate on where the GPS is telling them to go. Right? And this is where they end up. Or fixating on the fact that I think I can make it in there. Um, we prematurely optimize. Okay, and think that just by following this one metric that we're going to be great. It's going to be all good. Oh, one more thing. Okay, behind the Toyota production system, Agile, Scrum, and so on and so forth, there's a bunch of mindset shifts that really have to occur. Going back again to Tahishi Ono, the guy with the book. Right? <coughs> There's a section in there right, about um, the misconception that mass production is cheaper. Right? And that's really where we start to gain this insight about efficiency versus effectiveness. <coughs> Let's look at two applications. First one is that um, <coughs> enterprises and, and businesses changed significantly in the last 50 years, particularly in the 80s. The idea of shareholder value, nothing has been more divisive to society, okay, in terms of the ratio between the average pay versus executive compensation, right? Um, and it's not a good thing. It's not good for our society, much less good for our products. If you look back into things like the 50s and earlier, uh, drug companies were, were interested in putting together products and bringing people in. Car companies wanted to make sure that you were a customer once and you were a customer for life. Nowadays, we try to dissect these things and we try, in particular with shareholder value, uh, we get a shift for a short-term focus on profits. A lot of this happens, a lot of this executive compensation, for example, is geared towards what's the stock price doing? The stock price goes up, you must be doing a good job, you get your large bonuses. Right? That will occur with, with corporate debt, not the debt, financial debt, but a, a, a debt in the products that they put together. Right? Now, they also will do things like decimate a lot of the areas of production um, so that they're not able to work better in the future. They kind of kick the can down the road. Executives are there for three years to get the compensation. They move on to another company and they rack it. Right? Not every executive is like that. Right? But this was one of the outcrops. Go back and you know, watch uh, the uh, um, Stone movie. What was the name of that movie from the 80s? Uh, Greed is Good, uh, Michael Douglas. Uh, Wall Street. Wall Street, thank you. You helped me out there. Right? It doesn't work. Many times, we're actually better off controlling less and just watching the road ahead. It has to do with a town called Drachten. You might be familiar with Drachten, right? It's a, it's a, a, a medieval Dutch town. It has about 50,000 <coughs> occupants in it. All right, um, back in, uh, when was this? About 2004, um, a guy by the name of Hans Mondermann uh, was tasked with the um, the seemingly impossible thing of trying to fix traffic flow in Drachten. Problem was that um, he was told, um, you got this small medieval town, they got lots of these little roads, and they segregated out cars from people. Right? So you have stop signs, you have traffic lights. 
And the problem with you know, things like traffic lights, which is a 20th century invention, is that traffic lights, you look at it and say it's green, oh, I can go. And you miss and somebody's walking across the street and you whack them and they die. <coughs> right? Traffic lights also become a problem in that you impede the flow. So you no longer have a laminar flow, it all stops and starts. Right? So back in 2006, what he decided to do was to take all the signs and the traffic signals out of Brockton. And he replaced them with some traffic circles. Right? He put up, you know, um, took away all the distractions. So what happened? Well, one might think, right, if you don't tell cars stop now, you know, because you know, uh, you're going to hurt somebody otherwise. No, that didn't actually happen. They didn't have an increase. They had a nine to one decrease in the number of traffic accidents. And they had about a 30% increase in the amount of flow through the system. So more cars got through, even though they had traffic circles, okay, um, and there were less accidents because people had to look and observe around them. All right, so tell that to Mercedes and end up in the lake. Right? Um, you've got to stop being told what to do and when to do it. Right? Stop controlling people and delegate the authority to them to make it work after getting them to understand why we're doing this. And the other thought to, you know, to follow up on is that, that we don't want people and companies to get too comfortable, stay hungry and stay foolish. Right? Um, when was that address? 2008, I think it was, Steve Jobs said this to convince an address at Stanford. Got a lot of press for it. Right? He didn't make it up. <laughs> this actually came from, who knows this one, the Whole Earth Catalog. Nobody except me. Whole Earth Catalog kind of was like um, uh, a magazine of all kinds of things that were out there. You, know, you needed some trekking equipment. Here's where you can find it. If you're interested in home birth, here's some organizations that you could, you could contact. Kind of like a Google before there was the internet. We're talking here about the early 70s. Right. On the last edition of the Whole Earth Catalog, and Google it, and you'll see the image, um, back in 1974, on the back there was a photo and the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. The way I like to think about that right, is that as a company, we need to stay focused on what our customers' needs are. Right? Um, we need to reinvest the revenues and the income that we make on the products that are out there that excite and delight our customers to produce new products in the future that will bring us forward. Right? We don't want to just exploit the cash cows. We need to grow in the three horizons I'll talk about tomorrow. And we always have to continuously improve. Now, in terms of foolishness, right? Don't just accept, question, right? Be curious. The whys are more important than the what's, especially at first. We need to remove fear inside the organization to allow us to be foolish, right? Um, and there's nothing that should be wrong with saying our process has no close. Okay, this is a Hans Anders Anderson um, a parable. Right, about the guy, you know, the little kid who wasn't afraid to say um, the emperor has all these new clothes from people that didn't want to say, that couldn't say anything wrong about him, right? Because um, he would execute anybody that said that you know, he wasn't dressed appropriately or whatever. Dressed in no clothes, the kid saw him and said the emperor has no clothes. We have to be not afraid. We have to have enough uh, fear removed within the organization to say, stop. Our process actually has no clothes. We have to change it. And that pretty much sums it up. Thanks, Roller Fish. Um, we will now have some questions, answers, we'll debate, and we'll depart. Thank you. Um, anyhow, if, uh, I know the time is short, but there's going to be somebody in here that's going to be looking to use the room. I'll be around. Come at, uh, for the uh, drink.
drinks that are going to be happening later today. If it's fair. I'll be there. Uh, link me in. Give your card if you want. It's an act of as I fill out. Thanks again.